The following presentation was produced by the Buddhist Society of Victoria. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Last month, actually, I talked about views. I talked about views. I've been talking about views for quite, quite a while, actually, because before that I was talking about uh, the view that um, only the body dies, you know, what happens? Is there life after death? And I talked. I had two talks on that, and that is a view that was, um, it was a view that uh, at death everything finishes, and uh, I talked about that. Of course, there's the other view that at death there's an eternal life continues, and this, of course, is not a Buddhist view either, a view that the Buddha um, uh, recommended. So they were the views that I talked about in, uh, in two previous talks. But last month I talked about other views that run our lives. And the very uh, views, the impact of views, are very, very important. Um, because these are deep, deeply held beliefs or opinions. We call them, sometimes in English it's easy to say points of view, isn't it? It relates to the idea of a view or judgments. Uh, about uh, situations, attitudes, assumptions. These are interpretations of what the world is about. And these views tend to focus how we perceive the world, how we perceive ourselves. And uh, in doing that, it shapes the way we speak, the way we act and the way we think. So these views, sometimes they're views about ourselves, sometimes they're views about the world, and I'll talk about one of the views that I see um, that's given an example, actually, uh, that I think has, uh, you can see the impact of it, or I can see the impact of it anyway. And really, for an, an unenlightened person, for an unawakened person, it's impossible not to have views. There always will be views. But the measure of our views is whether they're leading to wholesome states of mind. These are positive states of mind, or not. And of course, for the Buddha, the whole, uh, the the most important factor is: is it leading to awakening? Is it leading to enlightenment? So, or, and this is what you see with many views: it just leads to conflict. <laughs> it leads to people um, uh, arguing with 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 each other. Sometimes even arguing with themselves. And often, there's a lot of ego involved. Uh, and also a lot of other defilements like uh, desire, desire to look good. But the example I was going to give before I get on to the subject today is uh, someone recommended a program on suicide, uh, the high rate of suicide am amongst Australian men. And I watched this program and I thought it was very good because it p I never had thought of it like this, but it pointed to the fact that the views men have about themselves, most of them not examined, not looked into, not questioned at all, um, are leading to a high suicide rate among Australian men. So in 2017, I saw the statistics, they mention it actually too, 2,250 uh, Australian men committed suicide. In the same period, 750 women committed suicide. <laughs> Amazing. And what's more sobering is that it said that in a year there are 65,000 Australians attempt suicide. 65,000. So if you take three quarters of them are men, that's a huge number. But why is this? And this is, I would, I, the program's also promoting this view. <laughs> it's because of the way men view themselves a very traditional view that men shouldn't show emotions. That it was a sign of weakness. And, uh, and certainly men shouldn't cry. This is a great taboo. <laughs> and even, even more uh, devastating is that men shouldn't ask for help, shouldn't seek help. And, and really, uh, very sadly, can't confide even in those that are closest to them. You know, even their mates, they can't tell. And uh, one expert commented, I thought this was really sad and it really stuck with me from the program actually, is that men who suicide actually often, they're really dying from loneliness because they can't tell anybody else what's going on for them. So this is one view of what men should be. But of course we have views what women should be 
And some of these are not questioned, not looked into. We have views about race that are very powerful, and we're seeing that in the Black Lives Matter uh, matters, matter campaigns, uh, demonstrations, and also about sexual identity as well. So there's many views that are operating that we should really look at uh, very seriously, question, just not, not believe too readily. But for the Buddha, there are two types of views, basically. He's very pragmatical, very, very, very practical. And one is the first one is wrong view. A wrong view is anything that doesn't lead to awakening, to developing the spiritual life. And for the Buddha, this, this, uh, these views are also out of step with reality and Wrong views will lead us to suffering, lead us to conflict, lead us to argument. And he's the other type of view, of course, having said this wrong view, is right view, in accord with re- which is in accord with reality and which leads to awakening. So they're the two types of view. So this talk is really about right view. And the real issue for all of us as practitioners of the Dhamma is how to develop right view in our lives. But before I uh, talk about how we develop it, I'd like to give an introduction. Um, Before the lockdown, I went for a bushwalk near the monastery. This is a Newbury Buddhist monastery, um, about 96 kilometres, I think, from Melbourne. And I went for a walk near a place called Blackwood and in the bush. Very beautiful. It's a, um, a temperate rainforest sort of gully. And it had many abandoned gold mines uh, in, uh, around, along the walk. We could see a few of them at least. And here we see the bush. And now in the 1850s, this was a town of 15,000 people searching for gold, mining for gold, living in very rough conditions, actually. And... Uh, it's, it's almost unbelievable when you see the bush now. You think, my goodness. And, of course, this points to the fact that everything changes, everything's impermanent. And by 1900, that mining had almost finished, everything had finished, and going went from 15,000 people. And I looked up the census for, um, for Blackwood, and it says, in 2016, 295 people. <laughs> it's incredible, isn't it? This is a Nietzsche, and we see it, it or over a period of time, we can see it very, very strongly. So I reflected uh, on that, and I reflected that the Bodhisattva, the Buddha to be, he was like a gold prospector, a prospector. He was looking, searching for gold. But what he was looking for and found was the gold of awakening. And uh, when he struck gold, as they say, <laughs> the awakening, he shared it with all those that, uh, of his contemporaries who, who wished to hear it, and also he passed it down. He made sure that it was available for future generations, us. So this is great. But the important thing for us is he didn't hide where the gold mine was. He showed us where the gold is to be found, where these mines are. So it's These area, this area, and this way, we know what areas to look at to develop awakening. We know what areas that are important to find the real gold of awakening. And of course, the area, as you probably are gathering from what went before, that the Buddha put a lot of emphasis on was right view, right view. And of course, right view and the whole of the Noble Eightfold Path. And he warned us against wrong view, what I would call fool's gold. And some of it may look like it's uh, important, but it's only fool's gold. It won't take us anywhere. And it's out of keeping. It's out of step with reality. So I'd just like to quote what the Buddha said about uh, right view. And he said, There is no single factor so responsible for the arising of unwholesome states as wrong view. You can always tell. (laughs) And no factor so helpful for the arising of wholesome states as right view. There is, and this is probably more experiential, there is no single factor so responsible 
for the suffering of living beings as wrong view and no factor so potent in promoting the good of living beings as right view. And this is from the numerical discourses in the ones. So this is the importance that the Buddha uh, placed on it. And so I'll talk about why it's important, right view, in a minute. Um, but what is right view? As I said, this is the, what made the Bodhisattva, the Buddha, when he awakened to right view in the Noble Eightfold Path. This was the key to it, really. And the important thing about that breakthrough was that it was by direct knowledge. We call it a binya. Uh, often in the, the Buddha's teachings, you see it as uh, knowing and seeing, knowing and seeing. So it has that very um, experiential feel to it, like it's happening. And it's not... He didn't work out right view, the Noble Eightfold Path, by thinking and, and pondering about it. If for the Buddha, this, the uh, right view is an expression of the reality he experienced when he uh, became the Buddha, when he awoke. And it's, a, as I say, a representation of reality, the nature of existence, in a sense, the meaning of life. And... Uh, it's apart from that, if it were only the Buddha's experience, of course, that would be his wisdom. But it's the roadmap for the wisdom, the understanding we need to develop. It's important to think of right view, because right view in itself doesn't convey the, me, uh, the understanding of this is what we've got to understand, what we need to understand to develop the, uh, uh, to develop the path to awakening. But we have to make it our experience, our understanding. It's not the, it's not, otherwise it remains the Buddha's wisdom. And this reminds me of the story of um, good, bad, who knows, because it's got this uh, element of right view in it. And this is uh, one that Ajahn Brahm uh, mentions in his book, uh, uh, Good, Bad, Who Knows, yes. <laughs> and it's about, a, I think it's a Jataka story, so it comes from the birth stories of the Buddha, and it's about a king who went, went on a hunting trip. He, he was regularly went hunting. And on this hunting trip, he injured his hand and um, one of his fingers particularly. And, but he always took his doctor with him, the court physician. And so uh, uh, the king was concerned about it. And the doctor, he, um, he bandaged it and uh, uh, cleaned it and everything. And the king said, will it be all right? And the doctor said to him, Good, bad, who knows? And sure enough, when after the hunting expedition had finished, got back to the palace, it had become infected. So the doctor, he did, he, he applied some ointment, cleaned it, applied ointment, and then the king asked him again, how will it, will it be okay? And he said, good, bad, who knows? And the king was a bit irritated, of course, with this, this attitude. He wanted some certainty, as we all do, as we all do. This is the issue with the coronavirus too. And so a week later, this, the infection had got worse and the whole finger had become infected. And the king had, uh, the doctor had to amputate the finger. And the king was furious, especially when the doctor, when they, and he said, well, will it be okay? And the, and the doctor said again, Good, bad, who knows? So the king threw him into jail. <laughs> he had enough of this good, bad, who knows? And he threw him into jail. But the next, and then the, the finger healed and, uh, you know, he, the hand recovered. And the infection was overcome. And the next time he went on hunting, he went out hunting, he got parted from the, 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 the party, the, the troops, the soldiers that he usually went hunting with, the group that he went hunting with, and he got captured by a group of tribal people. And they were delighted to see the king because it was their special day and they needed a human sacrifice for, for their special day. So they tied him to a tree and the, um, the priest in the village was doing a lot of chanting and getting the knife ready to to sacrifice him to the jungle gods, they say. And, but then the priest noticed, hang on, this, this sacrifice was imperfect. 
because he noticed only had nine fingers. This is not good enough. And so they released him. They rejected him. And the king was delighted. He was really delighted. And then when he made his way, eventually made his way back to the palace, first thing he thought, I must go and release that doctor. He, you know, it was terrible that I threw him into jail. You know, and now he's really saved my life you know, by, by um, amputating the finger. And he went and he released the doctor. He said, thank goodness, you know, you know, if you hadn't have amputated that finger, I wouldn't be alive. And the doctor said, well, if you hadn't thrown me into jail, I would have been with you on the hunting expedition and I would have been sacrificed. <laughs> so that's the wisdom of good, bad, who knows. It's, it's the wisdom of realising that uh, things change, that our, our perceptions are not always reliable. Something that seems so negative can actually have quite a different outcome. And it reminds me of the Buddha's teaching with a very similar vein. However we think it will be, it will always be different. And that's very true of life. We take these perceptions so, uh, believe them so uh, firmly we think it's the way things are, and then we go up and down with these perceptions. We, our emotions um, go up and down. We're elated or depressed, and then things turn out completely different. <laughs> so this uh, um, right view acts as a reality check for us. Um, and if we are suffering, if there are difficulties in our lives, it points to the fact that our view is not correct. We're wanting something from reality that we, uh, we, it cannot give. And this is usually just, <laughs> we all know, <laughs> it's this wanting things to be different from what they actually are at the present moment. You know, that causes us this, uh, this is out of keeping with the reality. But that's part of the Four Noble Truths, which is part of right view, and I talk about it later. But it's always interesting, people often say, why is the... Uh, why is it right? They find it difficult when you talk about the Noble Eightfold Path, you talk about right view, right intention or right attitude, we can sometimes call it, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right, mindful, uh, right effort, right mindfulness and right uh, samadhi or stillness. But what makes it right? You know, what's this right business about? But of course, right... This word sama in the Pali language means complete or full. And it's the right view, it's for reaching awakening. That's the right, it's the correct one for taking us in the direction of awakening. And of course people, we, I think most people know what uh, right view covers, but I'll mention it anyway. That uh, it includes giving, uh, it includes karma, uh, parents, uh, rebirth. Does the Buddha also mentions uh, um, beings that are spontaneously reborn and awaken teachers. And of course, the other one that the Buddha mentions are the Four Noble Truths. This is um, the core of right view. One of the nice things with the Buddha's teaching, so complete, and everything fits so to, so well together like a puzzle in a way, is that Right view is included in the Four Noble Truths and the Four Noble Truths include right view. So it sort of fits together because, of course, the fourth factor of the Four Noble Truths, the fourth truth, is the truth of the path that leads to the ending of suffering. So this is very neat, the way it fits together. But really, right view includes many other areas and I'll talk about that in the, the section when I talk about developing right view. Because right view is connected with reality. Anything that connects with reality is uh, capable, is an aspect of right view that we can develop. So why is right view so important? You always hear, you know, um, teachers say, you know, right view is, is the cornerstone, the key to the whole of the Noble Eightfold Path. And it, in many ways, all the, the right, we have right view and, as I said, right intention or right attitude and so on. 
the right in front of each aspect, each factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, that right points to right view, right understanding. And uh, if any of those elements, if the attitude, if the speech, the action, the livelihood doesn't come from right view, if there isn't that element of right understanding there, then it is wrong, wrong view. So this right view is really crucial for the whole of the path. So it's a, it is something that we, we need to really put some attention to, attention upon. So, and the Buddha actually puts it very well in the uh, sutta in the middle length discourse and he says, therein monks, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong view as wrong view and right view as right view. This is one's right view. Isn't it interesting <laughs> way of doing it? But the importance of right view is that it is the gateway. It's the key to becoming a stream enterer, the first stage of enlightenment. If we don't have this right view, we cannot become a stream enterer. And if we aren't stream enterers, then we don't have right view. There's something missing <laughs> in the way we're seeing the world. And it's very interesting because they say when someone becomes a stream enterer that they purify their view, their view becomes uh, purified and also their morality becomes uh, perfected by the stream enterer. But I'd like to also uh, to mention that uh, with, with right view, is right view like a catechism? We have these catechisms, don't we, <laughs> in various religions. I believe in dot, dot, dot. Do, do we, and we could say, I believe in giving. I believe in karma, rebirth, parents, awakened teachers, etc. But the point of this is not to have a catechism. It's not enough to just to believe. Um, it's not enough uh, for it just to be an intellectual understanding. We need to practice it. We need to realize it by penetrating it, understanding it deeply. Um, because on the level of concepts, uh, it's more like theory. These things are useful, intellectual understanding essential, <laughs> but they won't take, if, they, if we leave it at that, they won't take us to find the gold that the Buddha found. So, and this reminded me of a Nasruddin story uh, when Nasruddin was about to cook a meal. He was outside, so, and he had this uh, piece of liver that he was going to cook <laughs> just before, he, before it was going to be prepared, before he was going to make it into a dish. Down swooped an eagle and grabbed the liver. And, the, and Nasruddin looked up at the, uh, the eagle and shouted out, You fool! I've still got the recipe! <laughs> <laughs> this is like somebody who's got the recipe is the theory, isn't it? They've got the understanding, in a sense. they've got the intellectual understanding. But the meat is the practice, you know. The meat is the meal, really. It's the real thing. That's what, what it's about. So this is the liver. It was, uh, so. so it's something for us to practice, to investigate and realise, not something just to as like a catechism, I believe in giving, I believe in karma, all that. And the purpose of this is for, in order for us to know and see, and this is something you see in the suttas very often, the Buddha's teachings. So now this is the most important part of the, the talk, is how we develop right view. How do we develop right view? And of course the answer is <laughs> all those things that someone... Uh, who becomes a stream enterer does. All the things that lead up to a person becoming a stream enterer are the things we need to develop in order to become one of right view. And the Buddha, those, those causes and conditions for the arising of right view, the Buddha mentions two of these conditions. And they're, they're very... Ah, uh, oh, there we are. That's good. Two conditions, he says. 
There are two conditions for the arising of right view, the word of another and the work of the mind that goes back to the source. And he said then, in addition, there are five factors that build on right view and take it to full enlightenment. Virtue, learning, discussion, stillness, this is samadhi, and insight. So those are the two conditions. And the words of another um, are usually the words of somebody that has awakened, at least to the level of a stream enterer, the first stage of enlightenment. Um, but also the words of another, can't they? They can be the words of the Buddha from the suttas and from, un from, from uh, reflecting on them, investigate, investigating them and penetrating them. So that could be the words of another. And the mind that goes back to the source, looking at, looking deeply into, uh, into this body and mind. And one of the very, very important aspects of, of right view is also um, the way we can develop right view is awaken teachers. You know, as, we, as I'm mentioning, their words are very, very important, very helpful. Uh, any teacher that has got some uh, uh, more knowledge than we have, very useful. And the Buddha mentions that uh, a Kalyana Mitta is... And not, he said to the Vinu Ananda, it's not half the holy life, the spiritual life, it's the whole of it. <laughs> it's a very interesting. And he also mentioned that, the, that he himself is actually the best Kalyana Mitta for the best spiritual friend for people. And why is that? He said, uh, Ananda, uh, a bhikkhu who has, uh, a monk who has a good friend, a good companion, a good comrade, develops and cultivates the Noble Eightfold Path. That's important, isn't it? By relying upon me as a good friend, Ananda, being subject to birth, ageing, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair, are freed from them. By this method, Ananda, it may be understood how the entire holy life is good friendship, good comradeship, good a companionship. So this is a, 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 spirit, a, a spiritual teacher, very, very important for us developing right view, not only from what they say, but from the way they behave too. So the, the things that we actually <laughs> pay more attention to are the models in our lives, the examples in our lives, the words, they, they can be useful, and like the, uh, but it's what we, uh, what we see of the example that is very important. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, Kalyana Mittas can be anyone really who, is, who has a better understanding than we do. This is Ayakima always in, pointed to this. But we can actually learn from everything. And I think, uh, as Ajahn uh, Chah said, everything is teaching us. And actually, if we are aware, open, mindful, and using our um, wisdom, everything can teach us. But I, I'd also, I always feel in my own practice too that this uh, gratitude for all my teachers, whether they are enlightened or not, <laughs> I cannot be sure. But they certainly were very beneficial to me, and particularly Ajahn Brahm and Ayakima, but also Saido Utejaniya, Ajahn Jagra, and many others. And I feel blessed that I had these uh, teachers um, and that they, uh, they pointed out things to me that I found very, very useful. And they're example too, they're example. But the, one of the ways that we develop uh, our right view, a very important way, is through actually practising uh, what right view is about, practicing the path, all aspects of the path will bring uh, a greater understanding of right view. So dana, for instance, or giving, giving, the, men the Buddha mentions giving, it's very significant that the Buddha, what the things that the Buddha mentions. They could be cause, you could have mentioned a lot of things, 
a lot of extra things. But these things he considered so important that uh, he gives them uh, some priority, and giving is one of them. Because, of course, when we practice it, 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 gives, it purifies our minds if we're doing it from a very wholesome mind state. And it can uh, make us more open, more kind, and it can bring happiness. And one of the purposes, too, of giving is really um, to develop that happiness that uh, we can, when we reflect on our giving, our generosity, this is called chaganusati, because when we reflect on uh, our generosity, our kindness, and it doesn't have to be in material things, it can be our kindness, giving attention to people, listening to people, uh, whatever we do. There can be many types of uh, giving, but it gives rise to gladness, the Buddha said, and it can give rise to this uh, joy, and then it can give rise to tranquility in the mind, give rise to happiness, and then samadhi. He pointed that out. And when we, when we reach this state of samadhi, this is a state when the hindrances are down. <laughs> the, the vision is clear. We can see things as they are. The Buddha is always pointing to the fact that these five hindrances, not only do they um, block peace and happiness within, they also block wisdom. So once they're down, once those barriers to seeing things as they are are down, we can see clearly, and this is uh, seeing things as they are, yata bhuta, jnana dasana. So this is the important part of giving. And giving is very much, isn't it, part of karma. This is, they relate quite well, actually, because karma understands that um, is part of the, the understanding of conditioning, too, that everything... Everything arises from causes and conditions and passes away when those causes and conditions cease. So we know there are consequences of from our intentional, it has to be intentional, actions of body, speech and mind. And the Buddha always said that they, the results of those actions will be of a similar nature to those intentions. And he said, it's quite interesting, he said it's impossible for someone who has right view to think that doing, speaking, or thinking something negative, unwholesome, will have a good result. He said, somebody who has a right view, who understands reality, can't think like that. And so it, uh, when, we, when we see that, that there are results of our, our actions of body, speech, and mind, it really gives us an incentive to practice Morality, practice virtue. And it's very interesting for me that one of the, because this is what karma is about, isn't it, too, a big part of it, is, is creating um, good karma. We call it merit, punya, pin in Sinhala, and uh, decreasing the negative. And it's very interesting that Venerable Sariputta, when he talks about the uh, uh, right view one of, one of the aspects of right view he talks about is developing the understanding of the unwholesome, the roots of the unwholesome, and, the, the, and understanding the wholesome and the roots of the wholesome. And he says here, when friends, a noble disciple understands the unwholesome and the root of the unwholesome, the wholesome and the root of the wholesome, in that way that one is of right view, whose view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma. So this is from understanding the wholesome and the unwholesome. And of course, he, this is a very important part of the Buddha's practice. And the Buddha emphasizes again and again that the unwholesome are the 10 courses of unwholesome action, you know, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, and then the speech from speech, it's uh, lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, and gossip. And then mental states, even mental states included. Enviness or, or covetousness they use, is a very strange old <laughs> English word. Strong desire for other people's things. Uh, ill will, and he says wrong view. These are uh, wrong, uh, unwholesome actions, and they come from 
greed, hatred and delusion, which we hear about all, all the time, or desire, aversion and delusion, I sometimes call it. And of course the ten courses of wholesome action, the complete opposite. Uh, of those, abstaining from those and coming from non-greed, non-hatred and non-delusion. But so someone who understands this fully can become a stream enterer, uh, become first stage of enlightenment. And when they do attain to being a stream enterer, as I mentioned before, they, their view, they have perfect right view. And the interesting thing for a stream enterer, which is worth noting, is that a stream enterer is a person who cannot hide their um, uh, unwholesome actions of body speech or probably of mind too. And Buddha mentions this in the Ratana Sutta, he mentions it in other places too. And so, and we can use our conduct of, of body, speech and mind are the wholesome things we've done, said and thought. We can use this to reflect on our, we call it sila, you know, on our morality. And this like reflecting on our generosity can give rise to this happiness which gives rise to samadhi, clears the hindrances, gets us ready for seeing things as they are. And uh, of course the other aspect of um, developing right view is looking into rebirth. Most people <laughs> don't remember their past lives, <laughs> but some people do, so that's quite interesting. And it's, I always find it fascinating to look into their accounts of their past lives, you know, and to reflect on it. Um, and this is a very, very useful thing to do because it gives us more confidence, it gives us a feeling for it too. And you can see a lot of these things, uh, other people's experiences, in, we can read about them in books and we can also see on YouTube there's some fascinating videos of, of children particularly who remember their past lives. And that can be very, um, it can deepen our understanding of re rebirth. But of course, we can do it for ourselves, we can actually... Uh, if we develop the meditation, we can actually see, see our past lives. Some people can. And of course, we remember, people will remember that the Buddha, the, uh, the Bodhisattva, in fact, before he became the Buddha, he remembered his past lives. Not, not one or two, but millions of them, you know, eons of them. It must have just been an incredible inside experience for him to see impermanence on such a scale. Uh, incredible. And we need the, the necessary condition for actually seeing uh, our past lives is to have a depth, a deep meditation, a meditation where the mind is still, peaceful. And the quality that you can notice is the mind is very, they say, um, uh, workable. It will do what it's asked to do. So as Ajahn Brahm often uh, in, encourages people when they've had a deep meditation, ask your mind, what's the earliest experience in this life? And then the mind, if, if the mind is really, um, uh, really workable, it will go back to that. It's, it's almost like some animal, like a dog that's been trained to go and pick up some, you know, get the newspaper or whatever it is, and it will do it. And then you can ask it to go back earlier. And of course, he does give the warning for people because when the, often the, the experiences that one remembers in past lives will be very strong experiences. And one of those strong experiences, very unpleasant usually, is death. And, the Buddha, and uh, meditators have, who have experienced that, they say to Ajahn Brahm, oh, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> I don't want to go. And he said, the, the trick of it is to ask the mind, go back earlier, please, earlier, and move back from that experience and it will take you further back. So that's uh, one way. So we can investigate for ourselves, we can investigate other people's experience. And as I mentioned, and as the Buddha mentions, one of the, one of the supporting conditions for developing, after we've developed right view really, but also supports it, it, it very essential really, is, is stillness, this samadhi, to overcome the hindrances as I mentioned because we won't see anything new, <laughs> new while the hindrances are in place. And it's a bit like if, if we're wearing spectacles 
and they're all all uh, dirty and there's you know a smeary we can't see properly but if we clean those spectacles then we can see perfectly well that's for people wearing glasses <laughs> And this is what samadhi does. It cleans the spectacles of the mind so that we can see things as they are. Not as we want them to be, but as they are. Because when there's desire, there will always be that element of wanting, isn't there? When there's aversion, there will always be that element, element of rejecting what, what we're seeing. Uh, sloth and torpor, this is sleepiness and drowsiness. We won't be able to see much at all. And then restlessness, we haven't got enough power to see, to focus on what, we're, on, on what we're experiencing. And doubt, of course, keeps us wandering. So, and of course, the most, one of the most important things for the arising of right view, too, is insight. And as I mentioned, this is where we need to investigate in our lives, um, to look into it, and to look at our, in our experience of daily life. This is the stuff of Dhamma <laughs> for us. This is the reality of Dhamma. And I, I liken this to using Dhamma Nupassana. This is, um, uh, this is recollecting or, or looking through the eyes of Dhamma at our experience. And as I say, looking at it from the point of view of Dhamma, not drama. <laughs> That's usually we're looking at it from the point of view of drama. This is happening to me. In actual fact, it's Dhamma, it's happening. And uh, when, we, when we look at our experience through the lens of uh, Dhamma Nupassana, this is the Satipatthanas, you know, the four uh, focuses of mindfulness. So one of those focuses is the focuses are looking at the body, looking at uh, feeling or experience, pleasant, unpleasant and neutral, looking at the mind states that come up and looking at things in terms of Dhamma, looking from, from that aspect. So this Dhamma uh, Nupassana, very, very useful to apply in our lives. And to develop perceptions, perceptions are the things that drive, that uh, our views influence our perceptions, but our perceptions <laughs> really influence our views as well. They influence the thinking and they influence the, the views. So we can develop perceptions of impermanence. There's a whole list that the Buddha gives, actually. Perceptions of suffering in the impermanent, perception of death, perception of non-self. There's many, many. And uh, the sutta that I mentioned, I think, the last time or the time before was the Giri Mananda Sutta in the, the numerical discourses in the tens, number 60. But if you look around there, there's about three or four suttas on different perceptions that are very useful for conditioning the mind to look for things that we don't look for normally. We don't look for impermanence. We want to look for beginnings, <laughs> things starting out. Um, we don't want to look at endings of things. So this is a very uh, use. These are perceptions are a way we can develop our view, right view. But of course, the big the view, the big, the big breakthrough or the big insight for a stream enter. Everybody's going to say, Four Noble Truths. Yes, it is. <laughs> but it's a Nietzsche. Uh, because often when uh, um, we see with Venerable Kandanya, the first stream enterer, first person to experience the first stage of enlightenment in, in the Buddha's teaching, he was one of the five, first, five uh, disciples, first disciples. He, the thing that he reported was everything that is of the nature to arise is of the nature to cease. So this is the seeing deeply, not just in a superficial way into a nature. This is what made him a stream enterer, seeing that. And of course, when he saw that, it's, it's a whole package that comes with it. You start to see dukkha, you start to see suffering, unsatisfactoriness, and also you see that there's no permanent self. Because once one gets the insight of a Nietzsche, then any permanent happiness is, is not possible. Any permanent self <laughs> is not possible. And so this is the key to it. And there are very many ways one can develop uh, this understanding practice, this, develop this perception, develop this uh, insight. So we talked about perception before into a Nietzsche. But the one that I like the best there are others, the more sort of technical sounding ones. But this one comes from the Book of the Fives. 
and it's on the hindrances, and it's called Themes. And I'll just read that, because to me this is something everybody can do. <laughs> and not only in meditation, but in, uh, in their daily lives. So to me it's one of the very practical things. And he says, Buddha says, Monks, there are these five themes that should often be reflected upon by a woman or a man, by a householder or one gone forth. So everyone, the Buddha is saying, everyone should focus on these. And what five? I am subject to old age. I am not exempt from old age. I am subject to illness. I am not exempt from illness. I am subject to death. I am not exempt from death. I must be parted and separated from everyone and everything dear and agreeable to me. And then the last one, I am the owner of my karma, the heir of my karma. I have karma as my origin, karma as my relative, karma as my resort. I will be the heir of whatever karma, good or bad, that I do. And then the Buddha talks about, he says, in benefit of contemplating this, people say, well, what do you get out of it? <laughs> he says that you, you can abandon some of the, what he calls intoxications. First of all, the intoxication when you see old age. He says you can abandon the intoxication with being young. You can abandon, and when you see illness, you realise everybody becomes has uh, illnesses, then you, we can abandon the intoxication of health. And with death, we can abandon this intoxication with life. Because these intoxications make us think, you know, we're always going to be young. You ask a young person about getting old, and they just, it's probably not on the agenda. <laughs> it's not possible. Of course, they know, intellectually, they know that's, that's absolutely the case. That mum and dad must have been young once. <laughs> they weren't always like this. And the same with health. When we're healthy, we, we don't think of, of sickness coming, and of the sickness that uh, is part and parcel of life. And also we often ignore death and we think of life. We don't think about the, uh, the fact that life always ends in death. And he also said, apart from reducing these intoxication, it reduces, they are abandoned or uh, diminished, but it also reduces, when we focus on these areas, the... the uh, misconduct by through body, speech and mind. Uh, either, he said, they're abandoned or diminished. So this is an important benefit. But then, this is the real uh, um, showstopper really, is when he continues that the way we can reflect on it that can take us to the first stage of enlightenment, to right view, first stage of enlightenment and beyond. He says... This noble disciple reflects thus, this is, all beings that come and go, that pass away and undergo rebirth, are subject to old age, are subject to illness, are subject to death, subject to separation from everyone and everything dear and agreeable, are subject to come karma. None are exempt from these. As one often reflects on these themes, the path is generated path arises. So this is the beginning of right view. This is right view coming up. And this person pursues this path, develops and cultivates it. And as, as they do this, the fetters are entirely abandoned and the underlying tendencies are uprooted. So this is all the way to enlightenment, full enlightenment, awakening. So this understanding of a Nietzsche, and this is old age, sickness and death, separation, karma, these are things we're doing every day. <laughs> so we can reflect on it. But the thing is we don't often reflect on it. So, but when we do reflect on it, it can take us all the way to enlightenment. And particularly when we realise the important thing with this reflection is that all beings, not just ourselves, all beings, and this is where something becomes dhamma rather than drama, when it's us, it's drama. When it's all beings, it's dhamma. <laughs> it's true for everyone. But of course, the, and we're getting close to the end of this talk, the most, uh, this allows one to, uh, this understanding of Anicca too, brings up with it the Four Noble Truths, which is the heart of the Buddhist path. The truth of suffering, its cause, its cessation, the ending of uh, suffering, and the path leading to this ending of suffering. And the Buddha encourages us to 
to learn this Dhamma, to memorize it, to recite it, to investigate, and then go deeply into it. When the mind is pure, when it's after some uh, samadhi, after, after some stillness, and to, to penetrate it by view, he calls it. So this is right view in order to have direct experience, abhinya. So this is the, the most, the, um, the aspect of right view along with anicca, the insight that will take us to the first stage of enlightenment. So the first noble truth, of course, is that uh, whatever is impermanent is dukkha and uh, that we cannot find permanent happiness in uh, in birth, old age, sickness, death. There are many aspects to um, what is actually we can call dukkha. One of the best, one of the most important for me is not getting what you want. <laughs> I think that puts it very well. It's quite interesting, the Buddha actually even says, in brief, the five uh, personality factors, they're sometimes called the aggregates or, kan- aggregates or khandas, are sub- subject to clinging, they are dukkha. So he's more or less pointing out that actually the basic process <laughs> it will generate uh, this dukkha. It is subject to it. So very, uh, it's quite a, a deep, a deep uh, truth. And then, of course, the second noble truth is uh, the truth of craving uh, and this is the craving for sensual desires, craving for existence, craving for non-existence. And it's basically wanting things to be other than they are at that particular moment, as I mentioned before. And when we, when we want things to be other than they are, we suffer, of course, we're out of step with reality. And we need to check what is it I'm wanting? <laughs> this is actually a very good reflection. Uh, and Or what am I trying to get rid of? That's also another form of wanting. So this is a very important part of the path because once we know in our lives too what's causing us the grief, we can do something about it. And there's a lovely story from Ajahn Chah where he recounts the story of the mangy dog. This is a story that the Buddha told actually too where the Buddha noted that there was a, a um, it's actually a jackal not a dog really that uh, was he, he'd seen and it was it would go under a bush and then after a while it'd get agitated and run and go in, into a cave and then come out of the cave then lie down and run and then it would get up and run and would it couldn't stay still no matter what it did and the reason for that the mange the mange, it had this disease. Wherever it went, it would not find relief. So Ajahn Chah, he related this as as, uh, in his life, he related, he said when he was uh, a younger monk, he he was discontent when he stayed in monasteries with the monks and novices. He thought that they he had a very critical mind. He thought they were sloppy, they didn't practice hard like himself. Comparing, isn't it? And even when he stayed on his own, he found this ten- discon- discontent came up. He wasn't happy with himself. He wasn't happy with the villagers that were supporting him on the arms round. And he realised he was like that dog with mange. Everywhere it goes, it itches. And it doesn't realise it's carrying it with, with, it, with him, with itself. Just as we don't realise often that like wanting things to be other than they are, we're carrying it with, it, with us. And he said he did a reality check and he saw that he needed to let go and let things, let people be as they are. And of course that that understanding, and of course this is the whole point of uh, dukkha, really pushes us to see what's causing the problem. Wanting or craving is causing the problem. And then to let go of that, which is the third noble truth, wanting things to be in a particular way or wanting to get rid of things. And of course, the fourth noble truth is that uh, they're the path of practice, how we get there, and that's the whole Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, there is a lot more that I could mention, but uh, just to mention briefly that uh, Venerable Sariputta, in the, um, his uh, teaching on right view, 
he mentions a whole list of things that the Buddha doesn't, doesn't explicitly mention, but when you think about it, it's there. For instance, he mentions that the nutriments that maintain our bodies and minds, when we look at them, look at the cause for them, and if we look at the ending of that cause and the path to the ending of that cause, that will bring us right, that is right view. So this is very unusual. And of course he mentioned wholesomeness, the wholesome and the unwholesome, as I mentioned before. But he also mentions that each factor of dependent origination, this is like uh, ageing and uh, death, birth, all of them can lead to um, understanding things as they truly are, to the f developing right view. So in conclusion, about time, <laughs> as they say in Olympics, at the Olympics, let's go for gold. <laughs> let's go for right view. This is a very important thing. And it's not something to, as I mentioned before, to just to be an armchair right view person. That's not enough. We've got to practice it, uh, use practice to develop it, use our perceptions, uh, use our sila, the giving, this is part of our practice, and then also to develop these insights. And these insights we can develop not only on the cushion, but in our daily lives. As I said, that um, breakthrough to the path uh, by reflecting on old age, sickness, death, on separation from all, all that is dear and delightful, and on karma, these things can bring us to a, the understanding of a Nietzsche, and also we can see dukkha in our lives too. So I'd like to finish there and to ask if there are any questions in the live chat, YouTube live chat. There are questions, all right. First question, Ajahn. How do we keep humble views and kindness for others when we achieve great material success such as academic achievement and wealth? How do we keep our egos in check? Oh, how do we keep our egos in check? When, of course, you know, when we, uh, we reflect on uh, Anicca, we can see, you know, maybe not for ourselves, we can see it in other people's lives that uh, they have had great success or they've had great acclaim for their academic achievements and maybe c completely they've been completely reversed. And I think everybody can think of some people that this has happened to. They've been uh, incredibly widely acclaimed, they've been famous, they've been incredibly wealthy, and the, the complete opposite has happened. You know, it's, it's, this is the nature of impermanence, of transience, that there's nothing reliable there. So this, is, this keeps our ego in check in a very, in a, a very real way. When we realise that uh, everything that's of the nature to arise will cease. And, uh, but this is at more of a superficial level, actually. So you can, you can think like that in terms of that will help put things in perspective. That will help put things in perspective. So I hope that helps, uh, reflecting on a nature. Yeah. When things are going well. Good, bad, who knows? That's the wisdom <laughs> you need, isn't it? Good, bad, who knows? Next question. Yep. How do I check if I have the right view as a person with conditioning and biases? There's no sangha around me, yep. and how the reality matches my view can be just by chance. Right, right. Um, yes, it can be by chance, but I think the, the way you can tell is if if there is any uh, suffering, difficulty, problems come up in your life, that's, that's giving you a prompt to, to let you know that something, you're out of key with re reality, what's really the situation. Yet sure, when we, um, maybe when things are going well, we can think, well, I've got right view. But when things don't go so well, then uh, it will become more obvious to us that, aha, uh -huh, there's something there that's got in the way. Usually it's this sense of self, isn't it? <laughs> that we, we, uh, we think that there's a permanent self in here. And this is something I didn't mention, but for the stream enterer, the stream enterer is, abandons what we call uh, 
personality uh, view, personality views, the view that there's an I, a me, a permanent I, me inside that's running everything. And um, one per a person who sees, uh, right, who has a right view, becomes a stream enterer and that is destroyed, that, that view that there's an I or a me in here. And then, and what, they, why, why they, what they're seeing is that things come from conditions and causes. It's not coming from an I or a me running it. The conditions and causes are happening for this to occur and it's not an I or a me that's making it happen. So, so I hope that uh, answers it. But uh, always, life will give us a wake-up call, that's <laughs> for sure. There will always be dukkha, and then, then, you can have to, then we have to ask. And this is why dukkha is such a good teacher. It uh, will press us for, to find the answer, you know, find out what's, what is causing, causing this problem, this unsatisfactoriness, this dukkha in my life. Yes. Next question. Again. How can anyone know the feeling that he or she is walking rightfully on the Eightfold Path so that the person has the sense that what's being done, what's that is doing what has to be done? Oh, all right. Well, no, what's, uh, what had to be done has been done. That's, that's actually a fully awakened person. So that's a, that's a completion of the Noble Eightfold Path. And that is liberating the mind, isn't it? Liberating the mind from two things. <laughs> liberating it from all the defilements, all the negativity, from greed, hatred and delusion. And also liberating the mind from wrong views, seeing things with wisdom, seeing that the nature of samsara is always going to be a nature, it's always going to be dukkha. Ananatta, you know, it's always going to be impermanent, transient. It's always going to bring be unsatisfactory. It cannot it cannot bring permanent happiness, satisfaction, and there cannot be a permanent self. So when one sees with wisdom, then the mind can allow itself to cease. Then things can cease until one sees with wisdom. Until one has that purity. The purity will allow wisdom to arise, and that wisdom will allow the mind, the body and the mind, to cease. That will be the cessation, the finishing of samsara. So that is, that is the, the meaning of what had to be done has been done. <laughs> That's the meaning of that. So, but how we know we are practicing the Noble Eightfold Path in a good way is to see if you know, wholesome states of mind, good states of mind, good speech, good actions are happening more for us uh, in, in, in our lives. So in other words, this is always the check, isn't it, for our spiritual development, is are there wholesome things in action, speech, and um, uh, thinking, feelings, all these things, are they increasing or is the opposite happening? Usually it's a mixture of both, <laughs> a little bit of wholesome, unwholesome and so on. But we can see the trend, we can see the trend. And the important thing with the right view is it gives us a direction so that we have an idea of where we're going. So it gives us the, the hope that we can purify the mind more and more, develop the wisdom more and more, and this will allow the ultimate letting go. This is the whole point of the path, is the ultimate letting go of clinging on to existence, on, on uh, staying in samsara. So I hope that was not too deep or <laughs> some practical. Yes. How can we understand the word noble as it relates to suffering, i.e. the first noble truth? Yes, yes, that's true. Yeah, there's a lot of that. I think the commentaries probably give you pages and pages of explanation of that. My understanding is noble in the sense that it takes, can take us to awakening, can take us to enlightenment. Of course, for many people, it's just suffering. It's not noble. <laughs> um, but where it's a noble suffering is when we're actually using it for the, the uh, raw material of insight and then developing the path, uh, developing the way out of that suffering by seeing its cause and then seeing that, yes, when I address this cause, it ceases. There is more peace 
and uh, then we know that this is the path leading out of difficulties and problems. So I think does that uh, does that uh, yeah so that's uh, so that's suffering is noble because of that I say because of that reason. But as I say, the commentaries they will have pages and pages of why it's noble. But it's only noble if we are using it as the source material <laughs> for developing freedom from suffering. <laughs> so thank you. I think that's. Uh, this prob this is uh, Mike, uh, like a request and yeah. some comments onto mm -hmm. it oh, from a listener. Um, Ajahn Brahm used to give blessings after his talk, which I find very beneficial to everybody. Mm. Ajahn Nisarano, can you give a quick blessing for those who are in depression or suicidal state of mind, particularly now mm. in this era of isolation? I think right view exactly what they need. I have been praying every day. Mm. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I just, just repeat it. I think right view is exactly what they need. I have been praying every day from the heart for them, yeah. wishing metta on them and hoping that they will find confidence, self-esteem, resilience, and perseverance in this time. So but most of all, I wish them right view and wish them to see the impermanent nature of life and in no way are they involved in it. I hope that this right view will lead them to dispassion and disenchantment. Ah, oh, sadhu, Because sadhu. he's asking for like some sort of blessing. blessing. Yes, yeah, so I was going to do a, a dedication of merit, so maybe we can, we can uh, do a blessing too. So we can dedicate the merit from today, um, you know, from taking the precepts, um, from doing some chanting, maybe even reflecting on the qualities of Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, and from listening to the talk, and also um, thinking about the talk, asking questions about the talk. So we can de dedicate this uh, merit to those relatives and uh, friends who have passed away. Um, and I was, picked, I was asked, actually, uh, someone mentioned to me that they'd like to dedicate merit to their mother, uh, who is Maya Mazumda. Maya Mazumda, who's a wife, a loved wife of Jagan Mazumda, and loved mother of Raju and Sanjay Mazumda, who died on the 26th of August, 2018. But we can think of all our relatives, family and friends, but also to, I'll do a little bit of chanting for them, but also a little, um, also a blessing for those that are feeling depression, depressed and suicidal at this time of COVID-19. Because right view, yes, it is the key. <laughs> for, for um, you know, relieving these states, for understanding that, you know, this too will pass. This is what we say. In actual fact, the next talk I give will be an aspect of right view, it will be on Anicca, um, because uh, on impermanence. This is, this is, as I say, crucial to developing the first stage of enlightenment. So I give a little blessing too, but you can join in too, and we'll share the merits with those that have passed away, friends and family, and particularly Maya Mazumda. Akazanta Chambumata Devanaga Mahindika Ponyang Tang Anumoditwa Chirang Rakam Tu Sasanang Akazanta Chambumata Devanaga Mahindika Ponyang tang anumoditwa chirang ra kam tu de sanang akazantan chambumata devanaga mahindika ponyang tang anumoditwa chirang ra kam tu tuang sanda idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo and that means this is for my relatives may my relatives be happy also friends as well and now for uh, a blessing 
I'm very good. And now for those who, just to finish off, thank you for listening today, watching today, and I hope it uh, has been of a benefit and that uh, we develop, we go for gold. <laughs> we develop our view, which will change life um, incredibly and then lead to much more happiness, much less difficulty. One who has the right view will be a stream enterer and will be on the way to full enlightenment, to the highest happiness. So now, for those who would like to, you're welcome to uh, pay respects to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha to finish off. All right. Oh, that's it.